So as promised, we, uh, we moved away from our Old Testament uh, readings, uh, very lengthy, I think like six to eight weeks. And now we go back into uh, some of New Testament readings. This one, the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, uh, probably the earliest Christian text that we have. Uh, this is believed to be the, the first, you know, in our New Testament canon, the first work written down. Uh, probably in the late 40s uh, AD. Thessalonica, uh, still a major city today uh, in Greece, uh, kind of right there near the, the Greece and Turkey uh, border there. Um, I think it's in Greece. It might be in Turkey. Uh, either way, I'm pretty sure it's Greece. Um, it's a Greek name. Uh, it was also a major city back then, part of the Roman Empire. Uh, however, the leaders there were very, very swift. They were able to kind of butter up to the, uh, to the Romans, and they had kind of like a semi-independent state. They, weren't, they were kind of left alone, you know, and to show their appreciation to the Romans, they heavily incorporated uh, their Roman pagan worship, their emperor worship, you know, so it was a heavily devout pagan city. And again, they kind of did that appreciation for the Romans kind of leaving them alone and, and letting them have some of their own sovereignty. Okay. St. Paul comes in in his travels and starts a church, gets followers. But then again, because of their heavy dedication to their pagan gods, they kind of start to harass St. Paul right away. And St. Paul very soon, as he founds the church, has to leave town. And this was against St. Paul's wishes because he, he felt he, his time there with the Thessalonians were, were too, was too short. He needed more time with them. Later on, he's going to, again, because he's concerned that these young Christians might fall away, he's going to send Timothy back just to see how they're doing. Timothy comes back and says, you know, they're doing pretty well. They're facing a lot of persecution, again, because of their heavy dedication to, to the Roman pagan practice. And few have even been killed and martyred. But their faith is firm. And so St. Paul writes this letter for a couple of reasons. One, to express his enthusiasm and gratitude for their faithfulness. Two, to encourage them and continue in the midst of persecution. But then three, also because they're still so young in their faith and he feels he needs to spend more time with them, he's going to give them some instructions and answer some of their questions. One of the questions, and again, I'm sure we'll touch on this um, within, the, within the week or next week, one of the questions that they had to St. Paul is, hey, St. Paul, I'm sure they didn't call him that. Okay, I'm sure they called him Paul. Okay. Hey, St. Paul, our brethren have been martyred but they died before Jesus came back from the dead or came back from heaven. What happens to them? Are they lost? Okay, that's the question, and St. Paul's going to answer that question in chapter 4 okay, of this letter. So that's where we're at. Now we're in uh, chapter 2. We, we didn't miss much. Chapter 1 is very short. It's a standard opening address. But St. Paul starts with uh, this first reading with that he works day and night in order not to burden any of you. Meaning that St. Paul didn't take money for his preaching and for his ministry. Instead, he would often make money as a tent maker as a way to supplement income. But don't think St. Paul was roaming around as a wealthy man. No, he was roaming around very poor, always trying to find some food, some proper clothing. You know, for St. Paul, his whole life was given over to the gospel message. And the only, the only reward that he wants is, is the crown of Jesus Christ. You know, God's blessing, God's, God's wealth, God's riches. 
being placed upon him, and he doesn't want to trouble on you, my brothers. But there's also a practical reason. He, he also wants to show he's not doing this for money, <laughs> you know. He's not like a televangelizer, uh, evangelizer, you know, send me some checks and God will bless you. No, he, he's not like that. But as he continues first uh, through, through the reading, that he's not taking money, he's not burdening them, that he sees them as a father to his children. You know? Several times throughout St. Paul's letters, you're going to hear him call and refer to himself as his father, as the father to the children. Kind of one of those um, lines that you want to always bring up when somebody says, well, Jesus says, call man no father. Why, why, do, you call, why do you call me father? Well, St. Paul always refers to himself as the father of the church that he gave birth to, you know, in Thessalonica. And then finally, this first reading ends that he gives thanks to God unceasingly for them receiving the word, but most importantly, receiving it and having it grow within their lives. Because I know so many times St. Paul preaches, and we see it in people in our lives. They come to faith, they're excited, but then they kind of just fade away. You know, they could have been easily, as Jesus describes in that parable about the seed thrown on the ground, you know, the, the third set of seeds, it, 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 it sprouts up, but then the sun comes down and, and it withers it. That could have been these people here in Thessalonica. The persecution, they could have just said nuts to this and just go along with the pagan people. But they didn't. So this is a very joyful message, one that St. Paul is very excited about, and one that we're going to continue um, in, his, uh, in the address. May God bless you.